So Larry, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin kind of in the beginning, basically when you got here to Tucson and how and why you got here to Tucson. Okay, that's in 1985. Yeah, I came here in 1985 to start to work with uh, uh, Hughes Aircraft Company at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I worked uh, approximately eight years uh, and uh, I got laid off but I still remained in Tucson. And then uh, two years later, I got hired back into the Raytheon. Uh, and uh, that was about the time that the uh, notices came out that the uh, U.S. Air Force, who uh, manages the Air Force plant site 44, which was Hughes Aircraft at the time, uh, started wanting to uh, reach out to the community more. And so they started having displays at the different malls in town with uh, uh, a uh, public relations person from the Air Force trying to get community people to come and, and see what was going on with a advisory board that existed at that time. And uh, that was in, in uh, I forget, 92 or 94, somewhere like that. Uh, and uh, I was interested in that because I had done a lot of uh, environmental things, which started way back when I was a child in, oh, in uh, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, where I grew up, we were known for having a river that had caught fire because of its pollutions. And uh, that was advertised in Life magazine and Look magazine and nationwide. And I grew up with that. And that made me much more conscious of things. And when I became an adult and, and ended up in Tucson uh, and heard about the, I had heard about some of the problems with water cleanups, uh, and I knew that the plant site that I worked at was involved with some of that, but I didn't know there was ongoing activities at that time. But once the Air Force reached out and started touching the public at the different malls, that uh, they were inviting people to come to the CAB meeting at that time. It was a CAB, mm -hmm. and that was an ongoing committee that uh, was trying to established things and that was mostly the citizens from the direct area that had been impacted very much uh, Hispanic community at that time uh, and uh, they they were doing as much as they possibly could but at that time the, uh, the TCE cleanups which we would see as the, the major grouping uh, there uh, it, it happened to be the largest contamination was from the Hughes aircraft plant site uh, secondary to that, the Tucson Airport was involved with a very large one, and a secondary site on the airport known as the Three Hangers area was also involved as another one. Well, it turned out that each one of these places I've mentioned was actually designated as a Superfund site by themselves, and that meant that the EPA was overseeing these groups, and it turned out there was seven or nine of these Superfund sites within the airport region of Tucson all in, around the, uh, where the airport sits today. Uh, and there were certain citizens that were trying to go to the meetings that were being called for each of these different sites. Uh, and uh, as I got more and more active, I went to several of the meetings and I noticed a few people that I would see at different meetings, but uh, I still didn't know much about it yet. I hadn't started attending the cab meetings or anything. Uh, but when I got invited from the Air Force uh, PR people that were in town, I came over to the cab and got introduced there. Uh, and uh, I decided I really wanted to be active. So I stayed in and listened to some of the committee meetings. And uh, we began to form the ideas at, at that time around how, how we could uh, establish some uh, ground rules for the UCAB to work under because primarily the cab at that time was watching the cleanup from the Air Force plant site group and not the other ones so much. Uh, so we went from there and uh, I think I've answered your question there. We have more to say on this, but let's, let's go and do some more things now. Yeah. Okay. So then it sounds like the advertisements that you were seeing at the malls was the first time that you had heard about the TIA, or I mean the contamination plume. The contamination plume uh, and, and understood what it was, yeah. yeah. 
And then, uh, did you notice anything in particular in the community that you lived in? Because did you live in the area that was affected? Actually, no. I, uh, I was pretty unusual because I did not live in Tucson itself at the time. I lived in the county outside of Tucson. Uh, I did work at the plant site, okay? Uh, but uh, so in the beginning, uh, I was looked at, I think, very cautiously by the members because they were a pretty close lit net group of people and they were working hard to try to fix the problems themselves uh, but I, I thought I could uh, begin to help them I had been studying quite a few things under the environmental concerns uh, so I was I felt pretty knowledgeable about different things for example the the term Superfund site uh, uh, if you haven't looked at it or know anything about it you might not even know today what it really means and, uh, but I had already learned a lot about those things. And I felt I could help the community be better involved with that type of thing. So we had, uh, I did join, we, this was under the cab. I did join that and uh, began to go to every meeting every month. And there was so much activity going on periodically, we would have a meeting every two weeks at that time. And uh, once we established that we were going to try to do some other things, I joined uh, the group and we began to have meetings. And that's when I discovered that uh, we needed, to, in order to be really sure that we could uh, meet certain goals that we wanted to begin to set, I felt that we needed to have to be able to touch more of the different sites as a community board. And instead of being exclusive to the airport plant site, I felt we needed to, to talk to the other groups that were out there uh, and find out how we could uh, get more activity together. So we began to develop a uh, set of ideas uh, that the board itself, the CAB board, could uh, feel comfortable with to achieve the goals that they wanted. Uh, some of the goals I couldn't see because we're talking about several different things. We're talking about the TCE contamination, which happened at all these different Superfund sites that were around the airport area. And uh, each one of those involved TCE, but they also had very unique characteristics of their own that, that we had to worry about as a community. And uh, even within the board itself, the members that lived inside of Tucson, some, some of them lived closer to one of these sites than the other, and so their concerns were more there than they were at the Air Force plant site, for example. Uh, so we had a lot of communications about that. Uh, that's when uh, we were getting close to setting up some rules that we wanted to work within, and uh, we worked hard at trying to uh, come to a consensus within the group on how we would do that. And uh, the EPA was, uh, was working with us and the Hughes Aircraft plant site was working with us. Uh, City Department of Water, uh, the Mayor's Department, uh, some of our congressmen, Raul Grijalva, he was involved in all of that from the very beginning. So we got to uh, know each other a little better and we finally came to a point where we had to decide whether we were gonna continue the way the cab had been running or whether we were gonna move over to a new name. And during that period of time, we decided on the name of the UCAB, the Unified Community Act Advisory Board, uh, because now we were gonna look at reaching out to each of these different Superfund sites and draw them under the umbrella of what became the UCAB. So that was our intention, and I believe we, we found that to be a, a very successful goal over time. Uh, and it became, it, I don't believe we could have been as successful if we hadn't done that, okay? Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. So what are the most fondest memories that you have? It seems like it was in the late 80s, early 90s when all of this was happening. Actually, this was in involved. the 90s when this all began, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was after 92, maybe 94, when we started getting involved in this. and. Uh, it turns out now my fondest memories are that uh, the board still is active today, and that's like 27 years later, and the board has been very successful. I was the chairman for the first two years, and in all of these years now, we've only had four chairmen, and that's powerful for the community to be able to say that. And uh, I get emotional when we talk about this. The community that kept going after I had to uh, stop being the chairman and, and I actually had to stop being involved in the group at that time after two years, 
uh, the group that stayed on and persisted and has been so successful are the ones that really deserve all the accolades for this work. They've been very dedicated, uh, and even their generations have gone on. Generations within family members have gone on in this group. Uh, one thing I want to be cautious that everybody should understand is, uh, even though the contamination impacted a large portion of Tucson, there's really the south side of Tucson that stayed dedicated to this work. Uh, many of the other people don't even understand that this ever happened. You know, all of Big Tucson, is, as it grew, a lot of people don't understand how impacted the water companies were in setting up a way to clean this problem up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right. That's why we're hoping that stories like yours and then others that are part of that era mm -hmm. and the generation, that you'll be able to provide kind of this history to not only larger Tucson, but even the newer generations in Southside well, Tucson. Well, we would hope so, yeah. Yeah. And so um, how did the Superfund site and the contaminants impact some of the neighborhoods? I don't know if you can describe some of the activity that was going on around this. Yes, uh, actually before, uh, by the 70s, we were, uh, the the governments and the cities and the population everywhere was finding out that uh, contaminations from industrial processing was a huge problem throughout the United States and that uh, Tucson was one of the largest groups that got impacted at that time. There were a few others around the country, but Tucson got impacted pretty uniquely because they depend on all of their water to come out of the ground in wells. They don't have a river to pick water from. They don't have lakes to pick water from. They don't have enough rain to get, get fresh water to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have enough mountains around them to take snow melt and add to the community's water base. So groundwater and the wells were the very important part for Tucson. And uh, that's where it became to be critical for Tucson to find a way to clean this water up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then can you describe, um, I guess you mentioned that you're the first co-chair for mm -hmm. the UCAB. Mm -hmm. And can you describe um, your role and the work that you did as kind of the first person that had to lay all this ground? Yeah, so maybe it would be helpful for people to understand that we, uh, we had the uh, Environmental Protection Agency from the U.S. government involved. A lot of people don't actually know this, but the state, every state has an EPA group run by the state, environmental protection rules that the state decides on because of the state's rights. And so they worked in combination between the state and uh, the federal government and the county. Pima County has an EPA group also. So uh, people don't understand how involved all of the EPA has been in helping to get this cleanup started and taken care of. So I wanted to say that for sure so that you understand how this became about. Uh, and all the Superfund sites that I've mentioned that were around the Tucson airport were all being overseen by the EPA. And that was uh, called, uh, there's a group, they've divided the EPA up across the country in groups. And uh, California, Nevada, and Arizona are uh, Section 8. And their headquarters is actually in California but uh, they located someone here to oversee this project who lived here. Mm -hmm. His last name was Cooper, uh, a very dynamic young man, and he was very fair with the community and making sure that things were listened to. The real reason for the board to exist was because the community did not have a say in how the, how the things were being run or if they had choices to make if they could be part of the system that would allow them to put their inputs in and find choices on how they felt it should be best handled for any individual cleanup. And that's the biggest thing that this community group has been able to do is stay together and make that voice heard in, inside of here. And at one point, once we got uh, the different Superfund sites coalesced under one community group, we were more successful in having an international standing, okay? And uh, at one point, we uh, got, got involved with uh, the, the uh, General Motors at that time had bought Hughes Aircraft, and General Motors uh, was being recognized uh, 
in, in the UCAB itself was being recognized as being one of the most successful and becoming the most successful in cleanups across the nation. Okay, and uh, the word was getting out to a lot of places in the country that the United States here uh, in Tucson, the community involved in that was coming up with ideas on how to help accentuate the cleanups and getting things that the community was involved with and concerned about into the mix. And uh, so at, at that particular point, uh, the government of Australia and the government of Canada, uh, under their Defense Department rules, had, had wanted to come to Tucson to meet the community advisory board uh, and find out what made us so successful. Uh, but that was just being a, an invitation under the defense contractor rules under the uh, DOA, uh, or the DOD, Department of Defense. Uh, so we ended up having the, uh, uh, the Secretary of Defense, the, Assic the Assistant Secretary of Defense from the United States of America come to Tucson and the uh, the equivalent prime minister from Australia and the prime minister from uh, Canada came to the uh, Hughes Air Force plant site where we manufacture everything to have a meeting with those groups. Uh, as chairman, I worked there, but as chairman, I was a community uh, community active activist more or less, uh, and uh, they wanted me there, but I thought it was too much of a uh, 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 that they were asking me to work more as a company person at that time, and I refused to go to that meeting. I told them I couldn't come because I was, it would cause a, uh, uh, an adversarial stand with the community, and the reason we had the community was to bring people together. So we finally got the uh, uh, General Motors and Hughes Aircraft people to agree to allow the community board to attend the meeting on the plant site. Uh, so I, I, I pushed real hard and I told them that the, the people on the board and their spouses should be allowed to come to this meeting on the plant site. And we were successful in that. We got everybody there and we got to talk to the prime ministers of both the countries and our undersecretary of defense uh, during this meeting. And we had a luncheon and uh, it was a pretty successful, I feel. But that's the very point where, as a community group, this advisory board became international at that time. And they had a bigger voice because of that. They were listened to, and they were successful. And they were the first in the country, not one of the first, they were the first in the country that actually had that happen. And that's because the people that were on this board were dedicated and they wanted the best for Tucson and uh, and then I had to drop out after two years and they continued to grow and be good at their jobs and I'm so proud of them. Yeah it seems like you had to orchestrate right a lot. Yeah a lot of that actually was behind the scenes all I had to do was suggest mm -hmm. and uh, we would work together as committees in the very beginning we would meet even weekly once we had a name Mm -hmm. Some of our people would get in subcommittees. We would meet and, and gather steam to figure out what to work on. Now, along with the responsibility of overseeing some of these sites as a community group, we also had to be active with each of these different groups. So some of our people got together in subcommittees and they would agree to go to some of the other places. But the major meetings always became uh, part of the UCAB meeting itself. Uh, so, but what you were doing was interfacing on these other groups with the contractors and the responsible parties for each different site. So the EPA never gave up its responsibility of having the umbrella of coverage for the cleanups of all the Superfund sites, but uh, the community now didn't have to have nine different committees. And that was important because we didn't have enough people involved to be able to cover all these sites reliably. So before the UCAB got really busy, the general thing that would begin to happen was the uh, contractors would do their work, the scientists and the uh, professional people that were involved with them and the responsible parties, responsible party being whoever was in charge of any one Superfund site group area, 
they would get together and they would always be being paid to be active and working on these things and they would come up with so, uh, some decision before the UCAB ever actually came up. The way that what they would do is each one of these groups would come up with something and they would decide the very best way they felt for any one site to be worked on and then when they had that already in motion they'd, they'd put out money to hire the contractors and get everybody ready to go then they would have a meeting at a high school or somewhere close to that district area and invite the community in by having newspaper advertisements. Mm -hmm. And then people would come to, to review what was being said and then the, but all of the people in the community were really audience people at that time. They were invited to come and after everything was already shown to them, they were allowed to stand up and ask a question or two but they were never heard as a voice on how to make sure that the community's thoughts were taken care of. And that didn't begin until the UCAB really got, got started and got involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah? Yeah, because I thought that was really interesting when you were describing it to me the first time, how you said that um, basically they were in, the community was invited to come to their meeting and then they would just provide the information but it wasn't this partnership as you're describing the UCAP. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, uh, the success in having a good uh, community advisory board is to uh, make sure that the community is strong and has a real voice so that they can, they can slow things down if necessary or they can have a good idea and speed it up. And it's always uh, one one idea of a, a EPA cleanup is to get in and fix it. The other idea is to uh, have a good public relations with the community, so the community can trust these activities and sign on to whether they agree with it or not. Uh, the EPA always did have the right to go ahead with whatever they thought was best, even with our voice. But as our voice got stronger, the EPA listened more and it was very, very good for the community. And, uh, and I have to emphasize, I was only part of the beginning where we established some of these ground goals and we saw that we had to have an umbrella to protect the community in Tucson as well as fix the problems. Can you describe some of the roles or the goals of the UCAB? Well, in the beginning, uh, and as we developed our rules around the UCAB, uh, our biggest goal was to attain a strong voice, to be part of the decision making for each project. And uh, that, that we, we were very successful. The, the board has continued to be successful in every step of that way, and that was the most important part, yeah. And how was it to develop the charter? Because I'm sure that you went through the whole process of developing that char charter. What right. was your experience on that? Uh, the, the very first few times, it was, it was hard. It was very hard. We had uh, individuals who were strong and had their own ideas. And um, it, it was very powerful for me. Uh, because uh, the community was based, uh, a strong part of the community had, had a strong Hispanic content, very intelligent, very nice people to work with, very dedicated. They questioned my dedication because I worked for the company that caused the problems. Okay, I'm an Anglo and I don't speak any Spanish and I didn't even live in the city of Tucson and yet I was so proud that I could gain their trust enough to that they would allow me to begin to help and uh, so we had when we began to have the board we had a set up for an election and uh, we we had a lot of the people who had been involved many many years more than I had who wanted to be the chairman and we we started off with an election and uh, we just did it by numbers of votes and we had so many people that we, uh, uh, the co-chair at that time, even while we were starting this, was the EPA. Cooper was his name. And uh, he was our moderator in some ways. So he could get us through this election process. Uh, and there were many of the people who didn't feel I was a good person to be chairman. But on the, we did this all in one night, but we had many uh, 
choices for an election. We had one one run of the election, and uh, if you had so many people in the group, you took the the four or five highest of those to stay in, and then we did it again, and then we ended up with three or four people, mm -hmm. and then we did it again, and then finally we had a, a final election all in one night, and I became the chairman, and uh, and I can only say thank you to that board for. Uh, We're accepting uh, that, that I was telling them a story that would be a valid story that would get them started. And so we're talking about now 27 years later, and after the first two years with me, this board has succeeded. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and can you describe who else was involved during that time that you remember that you kind of, you know, you're talking about these huge meetings, it sounds like big you know, energy going on. Well, we always, had, uh, we always had more uh, responsible parties and participants than we did community board members. Mm -hmm. So uh, we finally had to set some rules uh, on how these people were gonna be uh, identified at the meetings uh, in terms of when we have a uh, sign-in, uh, well, not a sign-in list, but we had a, a, a list of all of our active members and all the participants that came also which I'll call the responsible parties. So uh, any of the contractors, they, they would come and they were part of the responsible parties. Any of the companies that were involved in the original contaminations that wanted to be part of the discussion for any one site that they were involved with, they would be a responsible party coming to the meetings also. The city water company, being, we're talking about cleaning up water, and so the city water company had a big say and at that time, there was more than one water company. They didn't have a uniform water company in Tucson at the time. So other, other groups would come in on that. Uh, the state had, had representatives there. The county had representatives there. Uh, the Air National Guard, had a, we had one site just for the Air National Guard at the airport. Uh, and uh, the Air National Guard is taken care of in two ways, by the state. Of Air, each state has an Air National Guard uh, as a state function. Uh, but it's really a U.S. government. All the materials are supplied by the U.S. government to come in there. Uh, and uh, each county group, the county has an EPA kind of a group, so they, they came in under different things. So the county water supply groups, they also had a responsible party there. The Air National Guard, let's go back to them, sent a representative of the United States out of Chicago, and he came every month for the meetings to recognize what was being talked about with the Air National Guard, okay? But he was really representative of the uh, Air Force, okay? And the Air Force itself was overseen by Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, is the worldwide environmental for the Department of Defense. And so that's the place where everything started from in terms of PR, public relation concerns. The people at Wright-Patterson had, had uh, very small successes all across the country, very few successes across the country. And uh, the uh, people in charge at Wright-Patterson wanted to find a better example, and they picked Tucson as one of the places where they started advertising to see if they couldn't get more people involved in the, airport, the Air Force Plant 44 cleanups. So when I, we first started the UCAB, the primary cab group was overseeing a few of the ideas from uh, that inter, inter, interlocked with the Air Force plant site problems because when the Air Force plant site contaminations were found, it had spread all the way up to Irvington in Tucson. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, even though there were other sites in the way, the biggest contaminator at that time appeared to be the Air Force plant site, which was Hughes Aircraft at that time. So uh, we went through all these processes to get all these people to agree to let the UCAB have a bigger say. And there was a, there was a lot going on at that time, yeah. And so it also seems you talked to me about uh, when we had our initial conversation about some of the community outreach work that you were involved in as part of the UCAB. Yeah, actually uh, you have to be careful about that conversation because I'm, uh, the cab was actually busy working on some things before I ever got there. And before that, there was other groups. 
Uh, but uh, I, we're only concentrating here on the UCAB and how it came about in the conversations there. So some people listening in might be aware of the things that went on in their their site under a different program under one of these other uh, uh, super fun sites or something like that. It feel like I'm leaving them out, but it's not that way. That was history. Uh, even the lawsuits that happened way before was years before I ever got involved. So I only saw a picture after I got started in a certain way. And my whole t time there, I just wanted to help the community uh, to concentrate on the most important parts of each site and, and be a decision maker on which sites needed the work to be worked on also. So we got involved in all that at that time, yeah. And can you share with me a little bit about that event that you had? I think it was the Earth Day event, so that was one of the uh, initial kind of outreach programs. Yeah, um, the, uh, the outreach types of things uh, really got started within the UCAB once we had gotten uh, permission to have uh, more of the uh, responsible parties from the other sites come and join us at the UCAB. The EPA still always had their set of rules uh, on each site being independent. They were funded independently, okay? And by the way, the UCAB was not funded. Uh, there was money paid for it out of the government monies, like we had to pay uh, uh, a stipend to the uh, El Pueblo Community Center to use their building for a monthly meeting. That wasn't donated by anybody, but uh, within the groups there, that was taken care of. So the UCAB never handled any money of its own. It, it, they succeeded as volunteers completely. Okay, so we, we uh, uh, actually Tom Stubblefield and uh, Henry Vega, uh, uh, Manny Herrera, uh, and uh, uh, Manny's Manny's wife, they were they really wanted to uh, have more insight from the community and let the community feel like they could talk to us. So we uh, we came up with uh, the idea of the. Uh, community outreach, and out of all these people, I can't tell you which one had the first time to say it, but they all wanted to be involved. So we, uh, the community group itself, the UCAB, decided that one good place to go to begin with was the uh, elementary schools in, in southern Tucson. So uh, Tom and I went out and uh, touched bases with the uh, superintendent of schools and the uh, principals of the most local elementary schools. El Viro School was one of them, and I can't remember the others. Uh, and we, we were asking uh, if, the, if we could uh, find a way to have the teachers talk to the children or have us come and talk with the children a little bit about cleanups. And uh, the Air Force uh, and the uh, Hughes Aircraft Company at that time were involved in the community uh, for what they called the uh, what was it, the Environmental Earth Day. It's called Earth Day already. So uh, the, the uh, Hughes Aircraft Company had already participated at the county fairgrounds for fair, when the fair comes every year. They had already participated for, for Earth Day in that. And, uh, and talking to the people I worked with at the company, uh, and talking to the community, we wanted a good way to work with things. So I got the uh, people at Hughes Aircraft to agree that uh, they would uh, they would uh, support some of the efforts towards Earth Day, and allow the the UCAB to participate. So to make it a little shorter, we were able to convince a couple of the principals to talk to some of their teachers. We had some teachers volunteer to sign up to begin to teach their children something and to do a project. And uh, so at the old Pueblo Center, we worked for quite a while in preparation for the, uh, commu the uh, county fair coming up in months ahead. Uh, but we got the children to participate and make a, a project, a science fair project towards Earth Day. And uh, then we set up a uh, sort of a carnival at the Old Pueblo Center. And because the, uh, uh, the Air National Guard was part of the groups that we were working with, I'd contacted the commander from the Air National Guard and he volunteered his troops to bring out. They set up 
military tents in the old Pueblo parking center for us. For, so we had shade and we set up displays in there with the children from the uh, Elvira School and one other. I wish I can't remember the name of that. Anyhow, they came and set up displays and we set up a little group to vote on the, the kids there. And uh, in, during all this other stuff going on, I had contacted the EPA and Hughes Aircraft uh, in, uh, in the city. I contacted all of them and asked them, you know, we're, we're have, asking these children to participate. They need to have an award if they, if they get a ribbon. So what we did is we set it up so that we could get uh, uh, tickets to the county fair for the ones that had ribbons out of the display at the old Pueblo Center. And uh, so <clears throat> it was kind of funny because if one or two of the people would say, yeah, we can give a ticket to this one child. And I said, no, you, if this one child comes, you have to supply enough tickets to the fair for the whole family and to be able to ride some rides while they're there and have a few things. So between all the participants, we've got people to donate enough money to get tickets to the winners and their families to be able to go to the fair. And that was the beginning of our outreach programs. And today, some of that has spread to the high schools, I believe, in Tucson. And uh, uh, so they continue some of this work around Tucson towards the idea of understanding the problems with contaminations in your town and, and ways to excite people and incite people to continue to work towards having a better community for themselves. Yeah. And so is this one of your proudest moments or do you have another proud moment when you were a UCAB? Uh, Chair, well, I already mentioned that really the proudest one was when we, uh, we got the UCAB invited to the uh, tri Trilateral Commission at, U at Raytheon Corporation. Uh, and that was actually General Motors who owned Raytheon. Uh, actually, no, General Motors owned Hughes Aircraft at that time. So General Motors had taken all the responsibilities over from uh, what uh, Hughes Aircraft had been carrying on with. When General Motors took over, the, the people that worked at Hughes continued to work at Hughes. They just became employees of General Motors. Yeah. That was actually my proudest time, other than just being accepted by the community and uh, being allowed to uh, get a good start. Mm -hmm. And so what do you want others to know about your initial role uh, as uh, the UCAB co-chair or just the initial role of the UCAB in general? Is there something that you think uh, is not well known and you want others to know? Um, well, for myself, I think I've talked enough about myself. <laughs> but uh, I, I did find out from you that uh, the UCAB had been uh, recognized by the city of Tucson. And there's a plaque at the Valencia Library that recognizes the original members of the UCAB and the, and the uh, chairman that were on the UCAB. So when you walk into the lobby of the uh, Valencia Library, there's a large plaque on the left side of the wall that recognizes the committee and its work. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said before, I was only part of this for two years and this committee is still active today and they deserve that recognition, yeah. And do you still keep in touch with some of the members or do you attend some of the meetings that occur? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't attended the meetings. Uh, they, they send out a, uh, a uh, set of notes from each of their meetings and I stayed on the list so I could follow that and it's been very successful, yeah. And so now thinking back on your experience and everything that you've shared, uh, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? Well, I would hope that they don't forget how this all impacted them. Like I mentioned earlier, there, there are a lot of folks in Tucson who don't even understand that the water system was in jeopardy here. And uh, there, is a, uh, there is a feeling that if you hear that something is contaminated, that it's a very negative conversation for Tucson but uh, they've overcome uh, most of that. But they, I want them to remember that the work is still ongoing today. The cleanups may never finish. Uh, and and other, other places in Tucson may or may not have been found out to be a problem yet. So I, I hope people uh, understand that when they turn on their water to take a bath 
or to drink it, that uh, they always have to be vigilant and watch to see what the community is doing as far as the people in charge of the water company, the mayors, our representatives that vote on different rules for the state or the county or the city. Uh, the citizens have to watch after them, all of those folks just to make sure that they're following the conversations, yeah. And so it seems as you're describing um, when you were becoming a co-chair and even you just learning about the issue, that it was a big learning curve also for a lot of the community members as well as yourself. Can yes. you describe that yes. a little bit? Uh, well, it, it's because the, uh, the, the whole depth of how big the contamination was for Tucson and the fact that we don't have other supplies of water to draw from easily and least expensively. So it's very important that uh, here in Tucson we, we make sure that there's no more new pollutions if we can help it uh, and keep an eye out for even where you work and, and keep in touch and go to a few of the uh, city board meetings even once or twice a year and get a flavor for what's still going on. It's very important, you know. Mm -hmm. And how would you like uh, the memory of your experience to be remembered? Hmm. Um, actually, I already know how, what that memory is. It's the plaque on the wall. Have you gone on down to see it at yeah. the Library? Yeah, I found it, uh, and it, it uh, actually the people in the library didn't know where it was. But it's right on the, when you walk in, you, it's right inside on the wall, so you can't miss it really once you know what to look for, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah, and how do you think the memory of the Superfund in general, that the Tucson International Airport Area Superfund site, uh, how should that be remembered and the contamination? Yeah, so uh, it, 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 the, uh, we talked a lot about the Superfund site as you described it just now. Uh, I just want to reinforce that there was seven or nine small Superfund sites around the airport area. And uh, under the work of the UCAB and the EPA and, and the different government agencies, we got them to agree to fold the information over for the UCAB to have a voice on how, what the cleanups were. So now if they call it the International Superfund site, it's only because of the work the community did to bring that umbrella together. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure I answered your question, but I thought it was better to clarify what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that you've provided kind of that history because it's a little known history, right? That mm -hmm. in the beginning it was these separate Superfund sites and they were having separate meetings on all of these sub yes. subsections. Uh -huh. yeah. So I think it's very nice how you told the story of how all of this came together to now become the bigger Superfund site that has the UCAB now as part of that yes. kind of yes. governing uh -huh. board. And uh, that's the success of this group also because they, they got that umbrella and brought everything under it as best they could so that they had a strong voice and uh, uh, each little stage along the way, they were able to help decide when that would happen. Some of it was voiced on where the money was available for each site. Uh, in some, in the, the community had to sometimes change their goals uh, for each one site they might have picked out to work on because of something that got in the way and they had to wait patiently until they could pick up on that one again, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you were beginning to l work with all the responsible parties and the government agencies, and they were bringing to you all this technical hydrology information, soil information, cleanup information, uh, how was it for you to kind of learn all of this and what was most useful for you? Well, actually I had done some studies in environmental ideas in my lifetime. And that's the one thing that I felt I was strongest in to help the community get started. And so I was able to use that. And uh, I'm going to use the word translation. We're not talking about different languages, but we're talking about reading the verbiage that's in a contract with a contractor and understanding what it's saying and the intent of the technical side of how they're going to achieve this. And how do you get the community to be able to read that and understand it? 
So I would uh, summarize some of that for the community along the way so they could hopefully understand the, uh, without having to become an engineer themselves, they could understand what was happening inside their community. Yeah. And I think that was probably what I brought the best to the group. And did you have uh, a lot of the presenters of the responsible parties, maybe some of the consultants, um, did they have uh, that type of ability or was it kind of a learning experience? For yeah, them actually, um, when, I, when, we, when I started this conversation, we were talking about how those contractors and the responsible parties would get together and decide everything. I had to be very careful when I was talking to these folks along the way that they didn't step backwards and, and work around the UCAP in their technical talk. So uh, we would slow those folks down and we wouldn't allow them to be the engineer when they were explaining things. We would, I would interrupt them during a meeting and say, you're off base on how you're explaining this, correct it, talk to me so that, and this community group, so that they know what you're saying. Put it into layman's terms. Uh, these, these folks are really educated, but you're so specialized in your job, you have to talk to them in a way they can understand what you're saying. And if they got too far afield and trying to be too technical, we would drag them back to the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I understand that UCAB uh, is not per se focused on health studies, that it was more on the cleanup side of things. That's correct. It was the cleanup. They were very concerned about the health studies uh, and the relationships with that because it had impacted so many of these folks that were on the committee, their family members, and for generations it looks like that's still continuing on in some ways, yeah. And were you ever involved in any of those health study meetings or any of those type of research projects in the area? No, uh, no, I, I didn't get involved in, uh, in those things. Uh, I, I did begin to look into it, but I found I'd, I needed to find a way to concentrate for the committee on the things we could do something about, really, and had had to leave that other work to someone else because I wasn't uh, I, I wasn't educated enough to understand a lot of those things, and it, there wasn't enough time to cover everything for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you were aware of, of these studies happening during this time. Yes, and sometimes that was talked about during the community meetings. Uh, the, uh, each time there was a monthly meeting set up, we would set the agenda, we would try to set the agenda for next month's meeting before we left the monthly meeting we were in. So we had an idea of what was going to be worked on, who was going to be available to speak, and we always tried to leave some time in the meeting uh, for extra questions, but we always tried to have a, a basic summary ahead of time to know what people were going to expect to see at that next meeting. Yeah, Not the details, but who was going to be talking, which group we were going to talk about. We did have a, a lot going on. Uh, the, uh, the bureaucracy inside the, uh, the state of Arizona, the county and the city, they stumbled over their own feet several times along the way. Uh, for example, the, uh, the mayor had asked for the uh, uh, the director of the water company to come to our meetings and in the beginning he didn't want to come. He didn't want to be part of it and uh, I had to embarrass him and uh, finally and, and I, I put the word out to the uh, mayor at that time that you know you may think something's going on here but I'm really unhappy and I think it's time you do something about it so he, he made people start coming and uh, I understood they couldn't always have the same person at the meeting every time, but they should at least have a valid person who had knowledge of what we were going to talk about and can do the presentations that we were expecting. And uh, so we, we, we had our little infighting going on along the way. Uh, I tried to do some of that more so than just the committee members. Uh, but sometimes it was too big and you had to ask committee members to go and straighten out a few things with people along the way. It was just too big of a job. Too many different sites were still involved and we had drawn them in under ours. It's our responsibility at that time then to make sure we were covering the bases. And boy, this committee did a good job on that. 
Yeah, it seems you all were partners at the same table. Yeah, we, we did have our, our times when we had to sit down and back up ourselves as a committee and decide what went wrong with something. And uh, uh, you, you, if you had to apologize, you just, you just swallowed your pride and you apologized because these folks were there uh, for even a bigger reason than I was. Mm -hmm. They lived inside the thing. I worked there, but I didn't. In the beginning, uh, I, I just had empathy for how, how the community needed to get past this and figure out how they were going to go on with their generations too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what advice with all this experience that you've had at the beginning, you know, how you said just seeing all the different people that needed to be involved from the different sub-sites, bringing them together, uh, establishing this unified community advisory board, um, and then, you know, having to leave the group, and then you seeing the next generations take them on. Uh, what advice do you have for state and federal governments that oversee this cleanup when it comes to the community? Oh, um, they have to recognize that the community has the right to ask questions and deserve, they deserve the right to get good answers. And, and it's up to the, the uh, governmental groups uh, to make sure that they're reaching outside of their individual boxes to make sure that they can work together as a community. Because even these groups, they're part of the community also. And for them to succeed, the community has to feel like they have had a say. Okay, so what education uh, or communication methods used at the site were useful to you? So for example, um, the presentations that were provided or the in like maybe technical meetings that were provided separately from the UCAB, maybe pamphlets or out outreach tables. What was very useful? Well, from the standpoint of the uh, UCAB, uh, it was important to make sure that different members inside the committee uh, were uh, responsible for certain areas that they knew more about than the other committee members. And it, uh, they, they became the ones who helped educate the rest of the committee and, and get ideas together. And so uh, periodically we had smaller groups who were responsible. For example, when we were doing the outreach program, Tom, Tom Stubblefield and I went out as one small group to talk to the uh, principals of the schools and to talk to the teachers. Okay, and then that carried on farther after that because Tom got other people involved with him as a small group and they continued that outreach after. So by the time I was gone, uh, this was already on its own and the people were taking responsibility for that. Now that begins the education you're talking about at the level where the children are very receptive to that. And they already hear at home, when, when there's a danger of you drinking the water and you're supposed to drink bottled water, they have already understood the jeopardies that they live in daily. And so now your family, if your family member is involved in this committee, they understand that their children have had to go through this and they find ways to ed get them educated so that their children may not have to have the same problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then that, that's a great segue because it leads me to the next question is, did the Superfund site in your experience change your thinking about sources of chemical exposure uh, in your community or yourself? Well, um, there's a little difference in changing how I saw it and uh, finding out that, that I could modify my stand and decide how better to work with everybody else. And, and keep the activity on an upward basis instead of a downward basis. Because if you stick with some of your own original ideas when you're thinking in the beginning, you actually become a hindrance. If you don't learn to look at what's happening around you, get the conversations from the people and understand that you might not be wrong in what you're doing, but it doesn't fit this community. I grew up and my, some of my ideas came from Ohio when I was a child. And I had to remember, now I'm an adult and, and I have to listen to the folks that I've 
here I am saying that everybody has to wait and listen and get get involved and and I couldn't be reluctant to push aside some of my thoughts and and grow from that so that we had a better cohesiveness in what we what message we were sending out from the community group mm -hmm. to, to the whole community you know the the part that I found the hardest in all of the things we worked on was getting the newspapers the TV stations the radio stations to commit for example in all the time I was doing this community work not one of these types of people ever came to one of our meetings that's sad. They should send news people paper over, you know, the newspaper people or radio or anybody else. They should invite themselves over to our community group periodically, and say, well, what, what's what? Not in not in the whole two years was I there. Did they ever have uh, an involvement? Uh, and it was hard for us just to get uh, an advertisement out in the local news uh, that we were having a meeting this week. And then that, that was a hard thing, and I don't think we've ever solved that problem today. But the message has to get out for all of Tucson, not just southern Tucson, you see. So that, and that continues to, be, I think, to be the hardest for the, probably the group to overcome. At one time we had one radio station, it was the Christian radio station in town. They invited us over to, uh, to talk to them. And so on that station, we did get to talk about the community things, and the uh, the narrator that we were talking with had really great questions, and and uh, we had a chance to say something. But none of the other stations did, were we ever able to do that with in in all of Tucson. Mm. And that's so surprising, I think, because it's such it's historically from an environmental justice history perspective. It's one of the biggest sites, and it's the one that comes out in a lot of textbooks and has, That's you know, right. it's recognized mm -hmm. as an important site for all of this. Yes. So, and but I have heard uh, from others just since talking to them about my research that they had no clue that this site exists either. So See, it's really interesting. That. And, and I have to disagree with that because when you're talking with the, the mayor and the Department of Water and the county representatives, somebody in there has to recognize that we need some help getting this participation from these networks. Mm -hmm. And if you go to these networks individually, they make a decision on whether it's going to be a big news flash, and if it's not, they don't want it. They don't want to spend the time with it. And uh, back at those times, the PBS stations were not as good as they are today. But the PBS stations are a good place for this to get inserted into, and I would say it would be a good thing for our community group, the UCAB itself, to reach out to the PBS stations, because right here at the University of Arizona, they, they, they have at least three channels that publish out of here. We should send out some word over there and recognize that, hey, we would like some participation from you folks. How, what can you do over here for the UCAB and, and the community? Yeah, that's a great suggestion, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and how about in your personal life, like after you did uh, this work with UCAB, did it change your perspective on environmental risks that you face? Um, it, well, that's, I can't answer that question the way it's asked, so just a minute. Um, in today's world, we're at a crossing point where we really think that uh, the U.S. government might do away with the EPA. That's the biggest concern. We can't. Uh, one of the problems with the things you hear about uh, global warming, for example, and contamination, those are two different conversations. But in today's world, that's been rolled into one conversation. And you're either a tree hugger or you're not, one of the two. And that's not true. The things we're talking about with keeping your society clean, the cost of cleaning up this plant site, the, the Hughes Aircraft plant site in southern Tucson, is so huge to clean it up later. It's billions of dollars that are spent on this thing where having some EPA rules that keep the companies honest so they can't dump this illegally 
is so tiny in cost compared to the big cost of trying to recover and, and keep your community healthy, there's no comparison. And, and one of the problems is that they're beginning to try to advertise this as a global warming problem, which now they're saying doesn't exist. They have to separate those two conversations of contaminations from industrial content with global warming. We have to stop that conversation. As, as a community group, and we have to realize there are two different conversations about what's going on. And uh, somehow it's gotten rolled all together, and I think it's a matter of convenience for uh, PR people in different industries to say, we can just kind of slide this conversation in and make it sound different. And that's sad that that can continue to happen. We have to talk about contaminations from industrial problems in one big conversation and we have to talk about global warming in a different conversation because they, they don't really, just having the industry adds to other types of things, but I'm talking about uh, groundwater cleanups, air cleanups around your city, things like that. We have to control that as a different thing. You might benefit from some of those types of things. They may or may not help global warming. I don't know if global warming is a natural thing or not because it appears to be happening. But uh, I don't want to blame any, I can't put a blame on that because it's such a huge conversation. But when we're talking about cleanups and whether or not we're going to have an EPA to help make sure that it doesn't happen again, that's a whole different conversation that has to be, be listened to and found out a way to, to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so what additional information uh, would you like to have on the site or something that you're curious that you used to work on and then you're wondering, oh, I wonder whatever happened to this component of, my, of the work that we did on the site? Uh, that's too big of a question to really answer. Yeah, it's, it's way too big of a question. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. And then is there um, anything that you would like to comment on? Like, is there anything that you would like to talk about that maybe these questions have missed? No, but I would like to thank you for letting me be involved in this conversation. And uh, I think your project is very worthwhile. Thank you very much. And we're very excited to be able to have the different generations of co-chairs. Uh, kind of a general overview of the photograph and, and like why you selected this photograph or what memories this photograph yeah. brings to you. Uh, so this photograph goes back to a conversation we've already had and that was the uh, educational outreach program that we started. We. Uh, got the, the children to involve themselves and make up little displays that we took to the uh, El, El Pueblo Neighborhood Center where we got the uh, Air National Guard to set up tents and we had a nice little carnival there. So the winners from that were allowed to bring their displays and actually all the people that had displays, they were allowed to bring those to the uh, county fair in Tucson. And this is a picture that was taken at the county fair the Tomahawk missile that you see was supplied by, uh, by Hughes Aircraft and General Motors. This is a, a mock-up of an actual sized Tomahawk missile that we build in, at Tucson. And uh, you can see it says the Air Force Hughes Earth Day. And they had already uh, done this before. They'd had Earth Day at the county fair, but they'd never brought a missile. So uh, I took it upon myself to get permission to bring a missile over. This is not a real missile, but it's a mock-up. And uh, so they, uh, they brought it over to the county fair and we set up the display for the children to have there. Uh, I, I got the EPA to uh, agree to take photographs at the county fair with Polaroid camera and film. And so each child that came and wanted to, they could sit on this missile and get a personal picture of themselves. Okay, and this was courtesy actually of the UCAP and the Hughes Aircraft Company, which was controlled by General Motors at the time. And uh, so the lady you see sitting in front of me on the missile, her name was Jan Woods, and she was the public relations director who I met first at the mall, supplied by the U.S. Air Force, uh, out of uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, she was very, uh, very special person for the, she was excellent for the project that she was brought in for. And uh, the culmination of this was the success of the UCAB 
uh, being involved in Air Force Day at the county fair with the children of Tucson that were uh, from Elvira School. Uh, and there we were. So that was a very nice day. Yeah, yeah. and what do you want people to learn from this image? That uh, if you're involved in the community, you're gonna have a lot of good feelings for doing it. You're gonna remember the, the sad days that you're involved, but you're gonna remember the good days much better. Yeah. Yeah. And is there, in, like, this seems to be kind of, and that's you, right? That's, yeah, that's me sitting that's in, you. in the back, yeah. <laughs> And so this seems to be kind of this really great point in the in the beginning part of UCAB where you have already organized and now you're beginning to kind of do these community activities. Yeah. So uh, this, this actually happened in uh, 1996. So it was within the first year of the UCAB that we were already getting successful with getting all of these responsible parties to agree to something we were asking for as a committee. And it was shortly after this that we were invited to the Trilateral Commission at Hughes Air Force Factory. Yeah, so all of this happened in a very short period of time from the time the UCAP started until we were seeing the results. And uh, that, that became very important for the community to see some good things happen that they felt responsible for, mm -hmm. yeah. So great, these are all the questions that I have for you today. I don't know if there's anything that you wanna add. No, I just wanna reiterate again, I'm so pleased that this committee has gone on for so long and they're still doing good things and they're doing it right. Mm -hmm. yeah, they deserve all the accolades they can get. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. Mm -hmm.